All right. Without further ado, I'm going to say welcome to John Froshauer, who is our speaker tonight. He's going to be talking about moths and butterflies. He's um, been well trained in conservation. He worked with state parks, Tennessee state parks, as a ranger um, for a while. He was at Radnor Lake. In 1989, he became the Regional Interpretive Specialist for State Parks in Middle Tennessee. He oversaw the Seasonal Ranger Program and worked with exhibits, events, and resource management projects. He oversaw the State Park Iris License Plate Program beginning in 1996, but now he's retired. And John continues to inform the public about our native plants and butterflies. He's uh, been giving talks with other groups as well and working on uh, Mac Pritchard's legacy. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll say, <laughs> I'll say legacy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> John, welcome to the group. Um, I know you have a really good presentation because we've, I've already seen it, but I think everyone's going to be in for a treat. Lots and lots yeah. of beautiful photos. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and sh uh, hit that share screen uh, at the very screen. bottom where it's green. All right. Do I have to pull my program up first or, or, or no? That would be good. Um, Either way. All right. Pull up this. Here's the program. So uh, now the green button at the bottom that says. Uh, screen. Well, this this program takes up the whole. I mean, this image takes up the whole screen. So let me maybe I have to do the share screen first. Um, let me see. Okay. Ah, oh, there we go. Compatibility mode. I guess that's what I want, right? The, there we go. Okay. Oh, there it is. And, uh, let's see, slideshow from beginning, which is beginning. Okay. So can everybody see that? Yes. Hey, everybody's, yeah. everybody's on board. Okay. And uh, and uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Everybody hears. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'll just get started then. Uh, I uh, I'll start off with a... a the image of a bird actually uh, you know, observing butterflies and and uh, uh, well, moths to a to a lesser degree has been uh, really uh, brought forward by you know, several things and uh, two of which we're familiar with is a, uh, a book that's very easy uh, to use in the field uh, butterflies through binoculars by uh, Jeff Glassberg um, if you want to study butterflies this, this is the one to have to put in your pocket and then uh, is one that uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with, the one that Rita Venable wrote, uh, The Butterflies of Tennessee, which narrows it down a bit further. Um, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit big to use in the field as a, as a quick reference, but um, this is good. Uh, I, I typically use, will use the Glassberg book and, uh, and then uh, go, to, uh, uh, go to Rita's book uh, as, as kind of a secondary source, but they're both great books. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about caterpillars too. And here's a real good caterpillar book. If you're not familiar with this one, the Wagner book, uh, Caterpillars of Eastern North America. Uh, it's very, um, uh, very informative. I used to use a little golden guide. Uh, so some of you know, grew up on the, on the little pocket golden guides and, and the one on butterflies and moths. I liked it so much because it had great caterpillar pictures. But this one came along, and you know it's a real tome. You know, really, it kind of swished it like a bug. And, uh, but it's a it's a fantastic book, very uh, um, full full of good information. And it maybe you may think, oh, I'll never find my caterpillar in here. But if you look hard enough, hard enough and deep enough, it's probably it's probably in here. Another one. Uh, let me. It's on the shelf here. Uh, the uh, excuse me. There's a, This is the, uh, I was meant to have these out before, uh, the Peterson Guide to Moths. And you have a couple that look, um, well, they look identical here. One is Northeastern North America and one is Southeastern North America. 
And there's a, there's a very there's a whole lot of overlap in these books. Uh, only the one in the southeast, as you as you may as you may think, uh, this this really contains species that are in the deep south, pretty much you know, down the coastal plain and and uh, down you know the fall below the fall line uh, down to the the, the Gulf uh, coastal plain, and uh, and maybe some of the Memphis species also, so species that you would see uh, pretty much in the Memphis area, but. Uh, but you wouldn't really see in Nashville it's a little farther north. So, so those are good good books to have. And then, uh, and then the other innovation is the uh, close focusing binoculars. Uh, you wouldn't really need these for for botanizing, but uh, for uh, uh, for observing butterflies, or, or, uh, these are something they can uh, focus. Uh, the typically typically they focus between like four and six feet. And uh, I know with with my pair, I can look at. Uh, uh, a butterfly on my big toe but so anyway but uh starting off with birds here this uh, uh great crested flycatcher was uh, uh photographed by richard connors and uh he's holding a hapless little uh praying mantis in his mouth so here we have uh we can see uh the, the food chain uh being pulled here um and uh that's what i like to think of uh in, instead of you know butterfly gardening uh, just specifically to, you know, you're thinking of attracting butterflies. I'm thinking of a food chain. Think of the uh, kind of a comprehensive view of it where uh, that, uh, that insectivorous bird is eating the uh, praying mantis, which in turn is a, is a, a carnivore itself. It, it uh, feeds on other insects, which are uh, uh, turn out to be consumers. Uh, many of them uh, feed on vegetation. So, so it's great to have these things in the backyard and uh, through, uh, through some of the things that I'll describe here, and some of the things you know, so you're botanist, so you, you'll know a lot of this stuff already. Um, we'll um, see if we can get these food chains and food webs going in the backyard. Um, this, uh, of course, uh, the hummingbird is a little bit different. Uh, it is carnivorous too; they like insects, and uh, particularly uh, uh, spiders. Uh, they uh, they really depend on spiders for nesting material. I mean, if you ever seen a a uh, hummingbird nest. It's, a, it's about the size of half of a golf ball, and it's just um, composed of little lichens and uh, little bits of uh, bits of leaves, and all all put together with uh, spider silk. But they, of course, uh, are uh, nectar sippers also. And this one going after the spotted jewelweed here uh, has a nice long beak and a long tongue. You don't see butterflies going after jewelweed that much, or this plant either. We know this one is a uh, trumpet creeper, a great big tubular flower here that uh, butterflies can't get that coil proboscis into very easily but those but with his uh his uh bill a uh, long bill and tongue uh, the uh, hummingbird can access it pretty pretty easily so uh but we'll uh, look at some things that uh, that the butterflies can access um first of all this is usually usually a harbinger of spring um one that you'll see um uh, as, as the days of winter uh, get uh, warmer in uh, march uh, into late March, you'll see the morning cloak butterfly um, um, flitting about, and it's not a big nectar butterfly. Not all butterflies are really go, going after flower nectar. Uh, you'll, you'll sometimes see them on puddles, uh, in puddles or mud, sipping nutrients and salts out of the mud, or even in, uh, dog do. They, for some reason, they, they get things out of excrement, uh, um, and uh, and this is one that uh, that tends to do that. And uh, this is one, you know, Bart, Bart and I were talking about uh, uh, some uh, butterflies being rather fresh and some being kind of tattered. This one looks pretty fresh. Uh, it usually has one brood a year, um, but will overwinter. If it overwinters as an adult under tree bark or something, it might look pretty ratty when it comes out in the spring. And then I've seen, he's probably seen it too. You, uh, you see a very fresh one and then followed by a very tattered one. The fresh one probably overwinters as a chrysalis. And uh, and they just so it's freshly emerged uh, in early spring, so that's something to look out for. Um, here's another one you'll see in spring. Uh, this is one of the 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 angle wings here, a very kind of angular wings, and it's called a question mark. And you might think I, I used to think uh, uh, that the oops, excuse me uh, that this this little uh, curve here look like a question mark, but it's not that at all. It's this mark right here, uh, which is a uh, kind of a stylized question mark, which uh, gives it its name. And it's another one that you'll see nectaring in mud, or this is a, this was on the, the, the side of the road at Montgomery Bell, uh, just uh, 
uh, nectaring uh, right on the uh, right between the pebbles there, and probably picking up um, picking up some moisture here. And uh, so here's another one that you'll see in the spring. Uh, it also has a summer form that uh, in which the wings are a little darker too. Uh, it's second brood here, but uh, and, and these are uh, this is one of the little brown jobs, the LBJs here. Um, this is this is called a wild indigo dusky wing. And I know Rita gave me it one time. I, I, I'm going to find it somewhere. Uh, is a dichotomous key to dusky wings. That's how difficult they are to uh, to to uh, distinguish. Uh, there's another one that comes out in the in the in the early spring called a juvenile's dusky dusky wing. And as sap flows into trees in in the spring, you notice the uh, you might see a, a wood a woodpecker holes or other wounds just oozing uh, oozing sap. And you'll see a lot of these guys puddling. It's called puddling when a whole bunch of them get on the uh, get on the wound there and uh, drink the sap from it. So, uh, so this is a the dusky wings are part of a group called the skippers. And if you notice there, their antenna, they're they're kind of spoon shaped. They're not uh, they don't look like little drumsticks. They're more like little uh, uh, little spoons. So that's the the dusky wings here. And here's our state butterfly. Uh, everybody should know this one, the uh, the the zebra swallowtail. It'll do a little bit of both. You'll see it on flowers, but you'll see it uh, down in the mud too, along with the along with the others. And uh, it's uh, uh, it, it comes along in early spring once the leaves of the pawpaw start coming out. And it's a, that's its only food plant. And then here's the caterpillar right here, which is a rather rare sight. One way to um, one way to look for caterpillars. That's the way birds do it. Uh, uh, is uh, look for chewed leaves, very simply, and you might find the caterpillars. But I really, I challenge you to find uh, a, a zebra swallowtail on uh, on a pawpaw, despite uh, having chewed leaves all over the place. They tend to feed at night, and they go down and they and they nest. They rest in the leaf litter during the day, and they come out in order to thwart predators. They'll come out uh, during night, nighttime. Now, this was at Burgess Falls. Uh, a few years ago, and if you've been up there, uh, the traffic islands uh, have been converted to, to butterfly plots, and they have a, they have a butterfly festival. And I was working; it was in August one year, and it was so hot; it was oh, god awful hot. And I think what happened was the caterpillars were getting too hot, and they just came out. There were two of them that came out uh, on this um, on this branch here, so I was able to get a picture of one here, and. Uh, we talked about complete metamorphosis. Butterflies go through complete metamorphosis. They hatch from an egg into the larva, the caterpillar stage, and then go into the, the resting stage of the pupa, and then uh, and then emerge as an adult here. And we can always tell uh, a swallowtail uh, chrysalis because it sits upright there. They uh, all caterpillars have the scent glands, the scent glands, uh, excuse me, um, uh, silk glands in their heads. And they spin a little dot of silk here. They stick their rear end on it. And then they, much like a window washer on a skyscraper, they have a, a safety belt that, that holds them upright. And they tend to look really anthropomorphic too. You see those little, little ears, looks like an eye and a nose. And, uh, but note the coloration. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a real master of the skies here. It blends right in with the leaves, uh, complete with the venation on the leaves being, uh, 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 being replicated. Uh, here's another... Um, Another master of disguise. This happens to be a caterpillar of the red spotted purple uh, butterfly. And what does it look like? It looks like a big dirt bird turd, you know. And uh, since birds are uh, a primary predator of caterpillars, uh, since they wouldn't want to eat their uh, bird poop, they um, the, this uh, protects them uh, very well. He's also got these big menacing looking clubs on his head uh, that actually they they can't sting or. Uh, uh, doing, they can't really hurt us at all, but he, he can swing that head around and it might uh, scare a potential predator away. Now, um, also, this uh, this one is feeding on cherry here, and uh, um, you, you may have read that uh, the wonderful book, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Ptolemy, and, uh, and I've read in it, uh, and you may have read in it, where uh, actually oak trees. Um, Provide them the most food for uh, provide food for the most lepidoptera species in the eastern U.S. So something like 350 six, six species or something uh, feed on oaks, particularly red oaks. And uh, you ever walk under a red oak tree during the middle of the summer and you get start getting a little inchworm silk all over you, and you'll start crawling on your collar there. 
That's uh, that's why that that oak is feeding a lot of caterpillars, and uh, that is followed by willow, and then followed closely behind by cherry. So black cherry is a great, real workhorse of a, of a food plant to have uh, to have in the backyard. I have a couple that I, I use for net rearing uh, uh, certain species, and I just cut them in half. You can do it's called stooping on them. You just cut the tree in half, and I it might not look very good, but you'll have a lot of sucker branches that will come up with some nice luxuriant. Uh, nice tender young leaves on it and, that, and that's the type of leaves that they prefer so when they're ready to pupate instead of sitting upright they'll spin their little dot of silk here and they'll and they'll suspend themselves from it you can still see it looks very much like the caterpillar the head and the little horns here and it'll uh, molt that skin and still look like a little glistening bird turd and we'll sit there for uh, uh about you know, 10 days or so 10 days to two weeks the, at the most and uh will emerge as the red spotted purple butterfly and uh, this one is common though. Starting about June, you really see them and they, uh, they have about three broods. Uh, they go through that life cycle about three times during the course of the summer. So they'll be around all summer pretty much. And uh, if you look at it here, it looks pretty much, uh, it almost looks blue more than purple. And if you look at the underside, uh, you see orange dots here. So it could, it could almost be called an orange spotted blue. But there's another group of butterflies called the blue, so it might cause confusion here. So, so this is a red spotted purple. Now look here, you see in the hind wings, and you start observing butterflies. Uh, a lot of times you, you'll see um, uh, you'll see some chomps taken out of the hind wings here, and uh, and once you start looking at uh, uh, butterflies, you, you'll see the hind wings. You know, all all butterflies have two sets of wings here: the fore wings and the hind wings. A lot of a lot of insects. Uh, most insects have two sets of wings, and the hind wings uh, usually have a lot of a, a, a little more elaborate, uh, elaborate decoration on them, and that uh, uh, causes predators to think that's the head end. So they think they're chomping on the head, they're chomping on the tail. Butterfly flies away to live another day. So now here's another caterpillar. It's like a red spotted purple here, but it is feeding on a cottonwood leaf. I found this over at uh, Ellington Agricultural Center, and if you uh, if you want to bring one of these one of these things home and uh, rear it, um, or if you're taking pictures of it, make note of what it is feeding on. That's very important because if if you want to uh, if you want to raise it up in a container or something, you'll have to feed it uh, the food it was uh, the, whatever you found it on, pretty much. <clears throat> Some uh, caterpillars um, can change food plant, but most of them, once they begin, after a few days, just feeding on one food plant, they're pretty much hardwired to it, excuse me. <coughs> and, and so they have to stick with that, uh, that plant. Uh, I've tried changing uh, food plants after you know, a week or so, and they'll, they'll, they'll starve before they, they'll feed on a new food plant. And then others I've, uh, I've seen just switch right over to, uh, uh, to another food plant. <coughs> anyway, red spotted purple. It's not a red spotted purple. It sure looks like one. It's in the same. It's in the same group. Is this uh, is this a monarch? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a bit smaller than a monarch. This is the the monarch mimic, known as the viceroy, and uh, it's called the the, the post median band right here that uh, goes through the hind wing that the uh, the monarch does not have. So, but uh, this one. This one is uh, is edible, whereas the monarch picks up glycosides from uh, the milkweed that it feeds on and is poisonous. So this is a one uh, form of mimicry uh, that helps protect the uh, protect the viceroy. So um, this we're probably familiar with this flower, right? The Dutchman's pipe or the woolly Dutchman's pipe, uh, in particular in Middle Tennessee here. <clears throat> this is um oh. This is one I, I have in my backyard. I, I started butterfly gardening here, I guess about just about 23 years ago. And uh, I, I love those flowers of the Dutchman's pipe here. And I got several feet, trees that are just covered with it now. Uh, you can see those vines that they've been on there a very long time. And they look very much like, uh, um, like they do like along the Duck River or the Harpeth River, uh, pretty much just festooning the trees and hanging down with those weird, weird seed pods there. But this feeds the pipe vine swallowtail, and that's probably the most abundant uh, butterfly that I that I get in my yard because I got so much pipe vine here. Uh, and this is the uh, Oversolokia tomentosa. Um, the uh, 
the uh, there's one called the macrophylla, I believe it is the the, the East Tennessee um, uh, species that is supposed to be uh, pretty much uh, confined to East Tennessee, but I found it in some property I have up in Macon County, which is kind of interesting. It's in the outer central basin. Anyway, there's the caterpillar of the uh, of the pipeline swallowtail. And it looks like he's about to bust out of that skin. And they do just that. Much like a snake, they will shed their skin uh, four or five times. And they may change appearance dramatically, or they may stay looking like a, uh, just looking the, the same, the way the, uh, the pipevine, the swallowtail does. And uh, it's called an instar. Each time, um, each time they shed their skin, it's called an instar. But uh, they will munch away on the uh, pipevine leaves. And... Uh, eventually form a chrysalis. We can tell he's a swallowtail. He's upright here uh, with his little safety belt here. Again, looking uh, looking like a little person there. Ears and eyes and nose and uh, a very alligator-like tail. Very strange looking. And uh, they can sort of, their color can uh, can uh, be a little different as well. It's, it's got a yellow uh, here, but kind of remind me of those Easter Island statues, you know, that those things with great big ski nose and deep set eyes there. Uh, um, but this is the adult. Uh, it's it's a rather small. It's kind of a, a medium sized swallowtail, not as big as a tiger or a giant swallowtail, but has a sort of bluish cast on the hind wing. And if you get it in the right light, it's it's kind of green. So you look at old field guides. This is this is called a green swallowtail. And then they switch to pipeline swallowtail on it. I don't know when there. But what do we see it? Nectaring on. This is a thistle. This is the Russian bully right here. This is the one we don't like. One of the farmers don't like getting in their field here. But um, but uh, in spite of that, it is a good nectar plant. The uh, thistles, of course, in a composite there. Lots of little flowers. And if they can land on it, they can sit on it for an hour and just uh, get all kinds of nectar from it. This is the caterpillar of our largest butterfly, the giant swallowtail. And it, too, looks like a big bird turd. Um, the perspective on it, the, I, I got this off the internet actually. And uh, um, at, at full size, these are maybe a little bit bigger than your pinky. This, he looks like he's pretty giant and uh, pretty big in this one. But uh, yeah, he's got, the, he's got the visual defense there of looking like a bird dropping. And all swallowtails have a chemical defense also. Uh, if you prod and poke them enough, you, you, you bother them enough, they'll put these two fleshy horns out called osmaterium. Uh, osmateria, osmaterium, and they contain just kind of a sweet, uh, sweet acrid smell. It's a weird smell. It, it smells kind of sweet and to us, uh, but, but kind of nasty. But if there's something of a similar size going after, it would probably be like a skunk. It would be very strong here. And uh, I'd be careful uh, if you do this, it, uh, it can't really hurt you. But if you touch these fleshy horns there while you're prodding it, poking it there, that smell will stay on your fingers for a long time. It's kind of like if you handle a garter snake and they musk on you, you can wash it off, but it just, the smell stays, stays with you for some time. So, so anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's what, uh, how a small tail caterpillars defend themselves. Here also is another master of disguise here. We see this, we see the stick just covered with lichens here, but if we look a little closer, particularly at this one right here, this is the chrysalis of the giant swallowtail. Very well camouflaged. There's another one above it too. I, I wish this picture uh, was, uh, excuse me, uh, another one right here. And if we turn the same stick at a different angle, we see, yes, two chrysalises, chrysalids uh, above one another, one above the other. We can see their uh, uh, characteristic, um, characteristic uh, silk uh, safety belt here. And so that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful disguise there. Um, and they feed primarily on wafer ash. Um, in, uh, in Florida, they're, they're considered actually an uh, agricultural pest on citrus trees. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll eat lime and uh, lime, lemon, lime, orange trees. That, and, and the caterpillars are called orange dogs or orange puppies. And they're, they're very plentiful of that. Uh, but around here, they like wafer ash. and uh, uh, so I've got that planted and I've attracted him with it. Here's the adult right here. Very wide wings. This has probably a five-inch wingspan, a very large wingspan here. And here we see it nectaring on 
uh, Phlox de Vericata, and it's woodland phlox. And this is a but this is a butterfly. Uh, some you will see like only in open areas, kind of like birds. Some birds will only like one habitat. You'll only find them in one habitat and not the other. But this one you'll find in the woods as well as out in the open here. And uh, um, I guess mainly because you'll find that uh, uh, you'll find the wafer ash in the woods. Uh, hop tree is another name for it. But at any rate, uh, it looks like a bat flying around. So big, big kind of deep wing beat, beats here. And uh, so in the middle of the afternoon, you think you've got a bat here. Uh, um, this is thistle right here. And here's a giant swallowtail. We see the underside has a lot of yellow on it. Um, uh, whereas the top side just has those has those few lines here. Uh, but this is the good thistle. This is this is uh, searching this color, the field thistle, um, which this is in my yard here. And this gets about eight feet tall or so. And it's a biennial. So when I, I started getting going, I would only see it every other year. But once I it started seeding itself pretty much, it shows up every year. Um, but being a, being a wildflower, it's kind of a free spirit. Uh, it does not necessarily come up at the same place every year. But uh, so if you've got a very small plot, uh, be careful uh, about the, putting this here. But uh, like that Russian thistle, it's got a little smaller head. Uh, but a but a great place, a great landing platform for uh, for butterflies. And uh, as I mentioned, that's exactly what they like here. <clears throat> There's a Gulf fritillary that's feeding on a house leak or some domesticated sedum right here. But he's in high cotton right here. He can just plop right down on this thing. Doesn't have to spend any energy hovering or uh, 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 wearing himself out just trying to position himself. He can just sit there and just and just nectar on those flowers all day. So so uh, that's. Um, this is the, the, the sort of uh, sort of plant they uh, you should put in the garden there. Well, we talked about the flocks earlier. You, you know, I'm sure you uh, know your flocks is pretty well, but you know, stolen infra, is that the creeping flocks? I think the, 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 um, you might put that in the front there. Then the woodland flocks gets maybe two feet tall or so. That goes behind it. And then maybe tall garden flocks you'd want behind that. So you have different levels. Butterflies like different levels. So I don't like it to be a little closer to the ground than others. So um Another good plant, it's uh, not native, but it's uh, pretty innocuous, uh, uh, is a uh, lantana. They love lantana, great nectar plant. Um, and uh, the butterflies seem to go for reds and orange and uh, blue and purple, more so than yellow. Yellow and white are kind of secondary colors. Um, they, But the, the most favored seem to be those blue and purple, reds and oranges here, but same thing, nice big landing platform uh, that, that this uh, clouded sulfur can just sit on and, uh, and uh, nectar to his heart's content. And uh, here's one, not so much a nectar plant, but a good substitute for the Queen Anne's Lace, the invasive Queen Anne's Lace. It's in the carrot family, Golden Alexanders. This is outside the, uh, uh, the nature center at the Cedars Lebanon here. <clears throat> this one, uh, if you look close enough, you might find the caterpillar to the black swallowtail on it. There's a little, a little characteristic saddle mark here, uh, feeding on feeding on the vegetation. And this is the first instar. He's about ready to uh, shed his skin. And uh, this is the, I believe this is the fourth instar right here. Um, that he'll shed his skin once more, and this the, the little band here will kind of be turned bright green in color. Uh, before he pupates there. And here uh, he's feeding on garden rue, uh, which, it, which is exotic. And this is in my yard. And I've got it growing near some golden Alexanders. And they seem to prefer this to the golden Alexanders. And also the giant swallowtails like this. And I've got some hop tree. I've got several hop trees growing, you know, growing here and there. And they really go after this garden rue. So uh, and uh, and I'm having a hard time finding it. I'd plant more. It's it's, you know, it's pretty. It's not very invasive at all or anything. And uh, I'm in a little urban yard, really. So uh, um, if someone knows where to get it, please tell me. <laughs> I'm having a hard time uh, finding it anywhere. And seeds as, as as well as as well as plants. So anyway, uh, so that that's uh, another good uh, food plant here. So it's the garden root. I heard some people get dermatitis from contacting it. And it never. I I never had any problem with it. But. Uh, here's the black swallowtail adult here, uh, a little blue on on this on the hind wing, and uh, um, sort of looks like a relative of the spicebird swallowtail, which we'll see. 
but he's a uh, nectaring on zinnia. Zinnia, another fantastic uh, uh, plant. And I've heard both zinnias are actually supposed to be native, maybe native to the Midwest or Midwest US. I'm not really sure, but they're a composite. And sure enough, he's plopped right down on top there and uh, drinking, uh, um, getting plenty of nectar from, uh, from this particular flower here. And zinnias come in all shapes and sizes. And so they're, they're a good, great nectar plant. Oops. <laughs> This uh, this is one that's still around here. It's kind of it's kind of going out now. This is in the front yard here. I, I leave it up the, the Daisy Fleabane, or maybe Philadelphia Fleabane. I forget which one here, but it is white, so that the the butterflies aren't after it as much as they are the color, more colored flowers. But I leave it up there because they some of them do like it. So uh, I just mowed it down. Actually, it was starting to go out, so I just mowed it down the other day. So if you got a little naturally occurring. Pockets of flowers, yeah, leave them up and let, let, let them have at it. Um, and uh, this, I'm sure we're all familiar with this guy, the monarch caterpillar. Uh, he happens to be feeding on the uh, butterfly weed, which is, of course, a fantastic nectar plant. Uh, uh, just summer, they, they bloom all summer long. Loves drought, very drought tolerant. Nice big platform of orange flowers that they really go after. And they eat the leaves, too. Uh, the... The butterfly weed does not contain the glycosides that the uh, uh, that, that the uh, other species of milkweed have, but it's still it, it's still a good you know uh, viable food plant for them. Uh, in uh, this part of the country, I've I've read that the common milkweed, the Asclepias syriaca and incarnata, the swamp milkweed, are the two most favored food plants of the monarch butterfly. So, um, and uh, yeah, and here we have one. Uh, along with some little aphids that are feeding uh, feeding on that milky sap uh, also. Um, and we know, uh, oh yeah, this, uh, another one, milkweed, uh, kind of be careful how you use it because it's another, it's another free spirit. I planted this in my backyard and it would not come up and would not come up. It way in the back where I have my butterfly garden. Well, where does it come up? In the front yard. And particularly right next to the walk here, or right in the cracks in the sidewalk. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on here. It's, uh, it's. I think it's messing with me somehow. You know, it's just. <laughs> you know, we have one growing where it should, right? Where I think it should, right here. But you have so much of it grows here, and they'll get. Oh, these will get you know five feet high anyway, and they kind of bend over. But beautiful pink flower, so it's a good nectar plant as, as well as food plant. But again, it's gonna. It's not gonna behave itself. So be uh, you know caveat emptor with the, this one uh, also. Uh, of course, the clover I try to leave you know patches of clover in the yard when I'm when I'm mowing when it's growing too because that's a uh, there are a lot of the, the small butterflies like to get on the clover the little blues like cl clover. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this is a this is called honey vine, uh, which is it's not like it, it's not an. Uh, Vine milkweed like like angle pod is, but it's it's in the dog bane family. I think I wrote down what ooh, it is. Um, I guess I I didn't write down exactly what uh, uh, what species it is, but it is in the dog bane family, and it's got the very smooth uh, milkweed pods. They're not spiny. They're not spiny looking and not and don't have angly wings on them too. They're very smooth, um, uh, smooth in shape. And they, uh, uh, what I've read about this is that monarchs don't eat it. Well, this is in my front yard here, and there's a monarch eating it. And I've seen it. I think one or two instances before where, where I was pulling it up. It does get kind of weedy, and uh, I, I started pulling some of it up, and I found monarch chrysalis on it chrysalids hanging from it so apparently they're eating it and the thing is there's there's a, a common milkweed plant about two feet away from this so i'm um, thinking the um the the female that laid this egg uh, preferred this uh, preferred to uh um actually chose to uh oviposit on on this instead of the common milkweed so i don't know what's going on i don't know if anybody has got any other experience with uh, the, the, the honey vine uh, and this species, but um, but uh, don't pull it up. <laughs> Keep it in the yard here because it, uh, it may be feeding monarchs for you. And of course, 
Oh, that modern crystal is just a piece of art, you know, the just this lovely gold spots all over it. Absolutely gorgeous. And <clears throat> and of course they uh you know, winter in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, we have a, the California uh, a population uh, wintering down, you know, down Southern California here. But the, the ones here are uh, heading to Central Mexico and uh, taking about three or four brews to go to get to the Southern Canada and then back down here. And if, uh, um, I guess Bart may correct me or not, but it seems like at least in this, in this middle Tennessee here, uh, it's, it's a very much, September, maybe late August through like mid September is when they're really coming through and they're breeding. Right now we're coming through. I was, we were talking about before. I had like five coming through. I did not see any ovipausing at all. You know, if you watch these guys, they will curl their abdomen underneath and deposit a single egg uh, uh, on the underside of the milkweed leaf. And I did not see any of that. So, so they don't seem they they don't seem to be interested in breeding here right now. They're I guess they're just continuing to go north. So, but Come, come September, they'll be, uh, we'll start seeing the caterpillars. Uh, I mentioned, yeah, I was in charge of this, uh, this Iris license plate fund for uh, 22 years, I guess. I was the first administrator of it. And it's now being administered by the natural areas uh, people. So, um, and they've been, um, they've been doing similar work with it in habitat restoration. We went from doing like simple landscape projects to doing something that had a little more meaning, like butterfly gardens, like the, the one behind uh, Cedar of Lebanon, uh, we put in with that, that, that funding and uh, uh, did a lot of uh, exotic plant removal with it. But anyway, you can see some garden flocks here uh, growing with some hypericum, which is a yellow, a nice uh, uh, large yellow flowers and cardinal flower and uh, uh, quite a few uh, other things in here. The, you know, Linda Robertson uh, does a fantastic job with the, with the Wilson County group uh, in this particular place here. Uh, and of course, milkweed just kind of, just kind of doing what it wants to here. Uh, it's overshadowing the uh, uh, a bee balm uh, or Monarda, Monarda, which is a good, uh, nice purple color here. Another good butterfly nectar plant. And we can't forget the grasses here. Gr grasses are very important food plants. Um, and I forget which one this is, a Panicum brigatum. Uh, oh, the, uh, but the, there's so many, uh, uh, so many butterflies. Uh, whose larvae feed on grasses. And there's a book on uh, the, the butterflies of uh, uh, butterfly gardening for the Southeast with special reference to Texas. And it has a really good appendix in the back. And the, the, the plant species that feeds the most butterflies in that appendix is Bermuda grass. And I'm thinking, oh, God, no, 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 not that. <laughs> Spent a uh, well, quite a bit of a uh, quite a bit of time and effort yeah, getting rid of that in these gardens there, so it doesn't overtake everything. But uh, unfortunately, it feeds quite a few uh, species. This is a uh, uh, you know purple coneflower, another great drought buster. You know, really loves uh, loves the heat of summer. Uh, nice landing platform. Uh, all different cultivars of this. You have one Magnus, which has a great big great big flower on it. Uh, this is standing stone. Uh, they took a. a uh, a playground that had some kind of wasn't really doing anything uh had a tire swing and a, and a slide up here so we took those off and um i got i worked with mike berkeley with grow a while uh nursery came up with the design here and we put this uh wisteria on it we think oh wisteria ah oh, this is the american wisteria and it is a, a cultivar it's available at the big box stores uh called Amethyst Falls. And another one, be careful how you use it because if you take a look at this here, I regret putting that in this garden there because it's it's just as horrible, horribly invasive as the uh, Oriental Wisteria. Uh, I spent a lot of time just you know pulling the skeins of it up. You, know, you pull it, it runs right along top of the ground just like the Oriental Wisteria does. Uh, but it feeds silver spotted skippers, it's a legume. So it feeds lots of butter, lots of butterflies like legume uh, leaves. Uh, but you can get the straight species. I, I think uh, Grow Wild is about the only place you're going to get them now. And I, I, I'm, I'm not up, up on all the native nurseries as, as I once was. But uh, is Sunlight Garden still around? I'm sure. Uh, you know, Marty Zinni, uh, uh, Marty and Andrea, uh, uh, north of Knoxville. They used to sell the straight species here. 
I planted the straight species in my yard and it just kind of crapped along until it finally crapped out here. Um, then we put some of the amethyst, I, I planted some of the amethyst falls and it just kind of limped along. But my girlfriend lives in Dixon, Western Highland Rim, and it went nuts there just the way it did up at Standing Stone, which is more like the, that's Eastern Highland Rim, kind of the edge of the, the plateau there. So I'm thinking that the soil is a little more acidic in those places on either side of the central basin. So if you live in those areas, <laughs> be careful how you use this. And uh, I really should, I should have put the straight species in here at Standing Stone. So just uh, think, you may think in that direction if you're uh, considering using uh, uh, using a, uh, the American wisteria, wisteria frutescens. And this is after probably almost 20 years now, this is how it looks in my yard. This is overgrowing a, a witch hazel tree right here. It's got these beautiful blue blooms, not quite as prolific as the oriental wisteria blooms, but uh, it's still very nice. And it's taken years and years to do this. So, so this one um, in the central basin, anyway, this is Amethyst Falls. This will tend to behave itself. But uh, so I would tend towards the, uh, when in doubt, I would tend towards the, the uh, straight species if you, if you can find it here. Now, this is the caterpillar of the silver spotted skipper. When they're real small, they'll take just a little section of leaf and they'll fold it and they'll use their silk there and they'll pull it together. And when they get bigger, they'll pull several leaves together and they're pretty easy to spot, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, here. And they'll, um, uh, so they're kind of safe inside their little shelter right here, but uh, they all got to go to the bathroom sometime and they, and they produce uh, lots and lots of uh, fecula pellets uh, known as frass. And as it accumulates on the ground below them, uh, birds, birds are pretty sharp. They can't smell, but they can see this pile of frass below a tree and they'll start looking up in the trees. They're pretty smart. They figure out that there's a big juicy caterpillar uh, up in the tree somewhere. So it, uh, and also wasps will actually uh, actually pick up chemicals. They can actually smell what's in the frass and they can start going after the caterpillar here. But what this one does, he builds up a lot of pressure inside his body, stick his abdomen out, stick his rear end out, and can shoot a frass pellet 100 times his body length. It's very, uh, uh, and I've seen them do it. I've reared them in captivity and see that little rear end come out and he shoots it across the cage. It's uh, pretty interesting. And uh, so, uh, that's one the way that the silver spotted skipper thwarts predators. But this was in Dixon here at my girlfriend's house. And she was out there one day. And there's a very opportunistic rough green snake who's, here's our food chain right here, uh, really going after, uh, systematically going from leaf shelter to leaf shelter, digging in and and, uh, uh, and getting the caterpillars. Wrens will do this too. They're not, you know, wrens, of course, you know, very uh, uh, very inquisitive and they'll, they'll, they'll dig inside these, they'll uh, dig them out of the, leaf shelters as well so she ended up moving the moving the snake off i don't think he was too happy about it but um she moved him elsewhere so he wouldn't eat every single uh, caterpillar up so. uh and if it runs uh if it's able to run that all that gauntlet there uh, it uh, turns into the silver spotted skipper butterfly one of the easiest skippers to identify here it's rather large has a nice silvery white spot on the uh, on the hind wing get those little, little spoon shaped antenna here this is nectaring on joe pieweed you know, Joe Pieweed, another great a composite there, a nice big blending platform on a good mid to late summer uh, bloomer to have uh, to have in the yard. Um, and uh, here's a liatris, and it's another one. I've tried planting in the yard, and I've had trouble with liatris, and where I see it planted in other places, it does it does fairly well here. Another predator of caterpillars is a, is a wheel bug, or <coughs> uh, similar to an, one of the assassin bugs here. And like all true bugs, it has a proboscis that folds down very rigid and harpoons caterpillars and sucks the juices out here. And here, this one is waiting for a butterfly or something to come along that he can harpoon uh, uh, just the way like a praying mantis would with his four legs. Here, you'll find praying mantises on these uh, on liatris as well. This is at Long Hunter State Park. And if you've been out of the deer trail there, uh, it's one product. I noticed this growing between the successional cedar growth there. And I had AmeriCorps crews come out. We, we cleared this whole field here. We even burned it. And it's a great naturally occurring population of liatris there. And the, uh, the, uh, the park will do uh, programs. I think about late June, they try to get it when it's at its peak because it brings in lots and lots of butterflies and all kinds of other, other bugs um, and spiders and, um, 
everything else within within its, the food chain here. So that's that's a good one to have here. Um, speaking of spiders, here is a great big garden spider in my yard. And he's a he's caught a uh, a nice big uh, tiger swallowtail. So if they're big enough, uh, they'll they'll uh, pretty much um, uh, they can pretty much take down a pretty large uh, butterfly. So. Anyway, uh, here's another predator, actually a parasite. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, these are the cocoons of the uh, little bracketed wasp. I'm not sure which one. There, there, there are a number of species in North America. And this is uh, feeding. They are uh, on a Pandora sphinx, which I found on the side of the house. So There's a grapevine as well as Virginia creeper, which is a food plant for this uh, moth, it's actually a sphinx moth butterfly. A sphinx moth butterfly, well, sphinx moth caterpillar, uh, that like all sphinx moth caterpillars start off with a little horn. And as it gets into the later instars, it usually drops the horn here, except for maybe that you've seen the tomato hornworm sphinx, this huge caterpillar covered with these things here. The uh, bracketed wasp was maybe an eighth of 16th or eighth of an inch long. It uh, lays eggs on the host here. The host, the, the, they, they hatch, they drill in, and they very ingeniously uh, eat around the spiracles, the aortic arches, all the vital organs here, and they keep that host alive. And uh, when they're ready to pupate, they pop right through the, the skin there and spin their little silk cocoon. And you might think, oh, I can save this guy. I'll just pull all those cocoons off, and he'll live. Nah, he's toast. He's <laughs> completely rotten and rotted out inside. He's not going to live much longer. So anyway, uh, but speaking of moths, I'll kind of move on to moths a little bit. Uh, this is the caterpillar to our largest moth, this Acropia moth. Uh, some people call it a robin moth now because it's it kind of it's colored like a robin. Uh, but it's a um, it, it's a, a, a very large caterpillar. <clears throat> so, you know, spikes spikes on his head. Uh, starts off as a little black bristly thing that has yellow on it, and it just keeps uh, changing as it as it uh, gets into the, the mature stage here. This one's feeding on cherry, another one that loves cherry. Uh, they'll also eat box elder, they'll eat uh, <clears throat> uh, elm, uh, persimmon, uh, even button bush. Uh, so, and uh, when it gets ready to pupate, it, it has one brood a year. It, uh, it spins a very elaborate cocoon with over a mile of silk in it and spins an outer cocoon and then a very, very tough inner cocoon that you can, of course, you can't see here. But uh, yeah, there's over a mile of silk in this thing. And you think, okay, well, we've got a silk industry here. Um, not so, it, it's not laid down in one continuous strand the way the oriental silkworm is. So it, you know, they, 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 they attempted it um, with several species. In fact, they brought uh, a species to the United States for the silk industry called a Cynthia moth. Uh, it's one of the, it's one of the Saturnians, uh, Saturnidae moths uh, in this family. And uh, it never really went anywhere and there's a feral population of it in the Middle Atlantic region around the Baltimore area, in the in the, uh, kind of the, the Middle Atlantic states, right uh, right there. And um, I've never seen one in the wild, but they're uh, uh, they're supposedly around that uh, focused around that Baltimore area. They may be in another area too. I'm not sure. But anyway, it comes out. Oh, this is beautiful uh, six inch wingspan. Um, and as with all the the Saturnians there, these hind wings have. Uh, um, these big eye spots on them. If you turned it over, what would it look like? It looks like an owl. And of course, these are favorite food of screech owls. Screech owls, of course, a small owl. Love cicadas, katydids, grad, you know, insects uh, that are up in the trees here at night. Um, and uh, so this is one way it protects itself. Uh, the uh, if uh, moths cannot hear, but they have very uh, they they pick up vibrations, and when they they feel vibrations. Of, 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 of a potential predator, they'll spread those forewings wings out and they'll display those hind wings and, and it might scare away uh, a screech owl. Um, so they're, um, let's see, quite, quite, a, quite an elaborate defense here. And uh, these guys do not eat, most moths do not eat. Sphinx moths do feed, you know, with the proboscis like butterflies, as well as the underwing moths. Um, and, uh, but most moths, as most insects in their adult stage, they'll live maybe a week or two, about, about two weeks. It's about their entire lifespan. They do all their feeding, uh, most of their living, about uh, uh, 
as as caterpillars. And in that resting stage, they'll rest over winter for almost nine months in that cocoon there. And they come out. The female will uh, send out a pheromone that the male picks up with this very large feathery antenna that contain chemoreceptors. And uh, they will get together. And you can see she is full of about 250 eggs. And so his admin is, is considerably smaller. But they tag a male uh, that actually followed a pheromone plume seven and a half miles to get to the female. That's amazing. Something we can't sure, certainly can't smell or detect. Um, the pheromone plume just, if it, if it wafts out in a straight line, he crosses it, crosses it, crosses back, crosses it, and just does a zigzag uh, pattern, uh, finding his way to the female here. So, um, and uh, this is uh, one we may be more familiar with. Uh, the, the Cecropia moth is it's, it's kind of rare, actually. You don't see it too much around here, but, but it is here. <clears throat> but this one, this is the Polyphemus moth caterpillar. Of course, a nice camouflage green here. If they get bothered, they sort of rear up like a sphinx here and, and click their jaws and make little clicking sounds. So that's what they'll do. And hopefully it'll scare away whatever might eat them there. And of course, this is, uh, this is the, uh, um, the adult here. Uh, with this big eye spots. And this is one you've, you've seen here, the attracted the lights here and there. Uh, this is a male with a large feathery antenna. A female will have a shorter, uh, rather more narrow antenna, antennae. So, and uh, of course, this is probably the one we're most familiar with in this group, uh, the Luna moth, moon moth. Uh, and again, another a male with a large feathery antenna, very well camouflaged as a leaf. And so, uh, and these guys like walnut, walnut and sweet gum, are the primary food plants here. And they will raise two broods a year. Um, and they just spin a real flimsy cocoon uh, in the trees there uh, for their first brood. And the second brood, they'll either crawl off the food plant and go down in leaf litter or in some little sheltered spot, or they'll just spin their, they will again spin the cocoon among the leaves and it falls to the ground. So that's the case for not raking up your leaves there, you know, that we have been told, you know, leave, leave, leave an area, uh, leave a portion of the uh, yard uh, unraked. So it will uh, provide a place for these, for the cocoons for the uh, Luna moth here. Uh, this is the Royal Walnut Moth uh, caterpillar here, feeding on walnut here, uh, also known as a regal moth. And he's the, uh, he's, America's largest caterpillar is larger than a Cecropia caterpillar, and it's got this very elaborate headgear, um, and he can't sting. That's I'm holding him there. I wouldn't be able to if he could. Uh, typically, when they have a large individual spikes like that, they don't really sting. It's kind of the bristles, uh, very fine bristles that will sting. The I.O. moths will sting. The buck moth will sting, uh, but but these guys do not. They're, but they can flail that head around, scare away predators th that way. It also uh, prevents... Uh, Tachinid flies and other parasites from landing. They, they like to land and lay their eggs near the head. Uh, if they lay it down near the tail, uh, the uh, the caterpillar can, uh, there's a good chance he can get his head around there and knock it off there. So, so that's one reason they have all this elaborate head gear. So I've been so I read anyway. But anyway, they do not spin a cocoon. They burrow into the ground and kind of squirm around and uh, they uh, sec secrete some fluid and a form was called a little cyst. And they will sit in it uh, over winter and then sometimes for even two years if uh, um, they, they don't necessarily, uh, their life cycle actually go a whole nother year sometimes. And uh, this is the pupa with the cast off skin right here and the little cyst here that it, uh, that it sits in for the for the winter. Comes out as this beautiful royal walnut moth. You know, it's a very, uh, and despite there being a, being a very large caterpillar, gigantic caterpillar, it's not that big a moth. It's only maybe, that two inches long and maybe a wingspan of two and a half to three inches. But still, it's gorgeous anyway. And there's a related species called an imperial moth, which is kind of the sort of mustard yellow with sort of this uh, purpley uh, purple coloration on it. But I love the colors of these things. They're just so, they're just uh, so fantastic. The, the cream and the and that sort of reddish brown, brownish red. Yeah. Um, here uh, we know our, our state wildflower here. Um, and we might know what feeds on it. Uh, another one that doesn't behave itself, uh, the more purple passion flower. Um, you can plant it next to a fence. Oh, this would be great next year when it comes up and grows along the fence 
It may not show up there, but it'll show up 10 feet away, like right in the middle of something else. But anyway, it's a great food plant for the uh, for the uh, um, Gulf fritillary, uh, as well as the, the, the variegated fritillary. And uh, the, the Gulf fritillary uh, uh, shows up pretty much, it's uh, kind of like the monarchs. They really show up in numbers uh, uh, around September. You'll see a few that are, that are flying like during the spring, but you'll start seeing breeding uh, in the um, uh, in the mid to late summer here, and they will just continue to breed. They are migratory. They will migrate like towards the Gulf Coast, kind of a short, kind of a short distance migrant. Uh, but they'll just keep breeding and breeding until the until they get knocked out by the cold. They'll you know? keep breeding and moving, breeding and moving until they knocked out by the cold. Uh, now, if you don't want to, uh, uh, again, if you got a very small garden, you may I you you may not want to take a chance on the purple passion flower. Because it'll it kind of goes crazy, but this is the yellow passion flower right here, Passiflora lutea, and um, I had this volunteered in the yard, and when I first moved in, I've been lived here thirty years, and it's always been here as a volunteer, and I just let it go, and uh, the Gulf fritillary is like it too. The the it's got a, a a flower similar to the purple passion flower, but it's considerably smaller, about three quarters of an inch in diameter. The caterpillar likes to feed on that, as well as the fruit itself. That's about the size of a chickpea. That's a little like the may pop of the uh, of the purple passion flower. That's the yellow passion flower um, fruit. Very small, and they they love to feed on. But so that's a good alternative here. If you, um, and there is the the pupa, uh, the chrysalis of the, the Gulf fritillary. It looks like a frog frog got them, but. Actually, a, a lot of these guys, a lot of these uh, critters, they'll crawl off the food plant to pupate. So, uh, so it's good to um, have something around. Uh, I've seen people that have gardens where they'll they'll have maybe a butterfly weed or something like that, and then just probably ten feet of just flat compost or maybe uh, uh, or, or maybe pine pine straw or something like that, and the caterpillar trundling across that is a sitting duck. Or a bird or something, something else. So if you, if you just, just kind of keep it, keep it just kind of uh, a little dowdy underneath there, uh, these guys can uh, these guys can easily find a place to pupate. And uh, this is probably about ten feet away from uh, the passion flower right here. And you can see that here, here's one. There's two old chrysalids here, and this one has just emerged from it. So you can see just like they tend to they tend they tend to uh, wander off to pupate. Um, and here's one. Here's a, a cloud, cloudless sulfur uh, that's uh, underneath the uh, the window frame. Or I should say uh, at the at the top part of the window frame, right near where I had some uh, partridge pea. Another one. Be careful how you use it. Partridge pea is a good food plant, particularly for the sulfurs. They 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 really like it, but um, it can go kind of crazy too. So uh, I, I battled it for years. I actually had to pull up so much of it. It just comes up. In, in kind of a small amount now and they and they do like it um and you might think well what about a butterfly house if i put a butterfly house up oh things will go in there and they'll take shelter nah they don't really use them that much if you're going to use one put it like lower to the ground and maybe in the shade there where uh uh it's possible that uh, a caterpillar might find it overwinter in it but there are lots of other things that will overwinter you put strips of bark in it and uh, and uh, if you're lucky, maybe a morning cloak butterfly might get in and uh, um, and shelter for the winter. Well, uh, I think the last time I looked at this on my back fence here, I opened it up and there's a great big brown recluse spider. Just, just one, <laughs> hey, put your hand in here. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so you should be careful with these things. This is something I've done with the canes of the Joe Pye weed and iron weed that I've had here. Of course, you probably know, you, you, you've heard it leave plant canes up during the winter because there are certain things that will that will burrow into them and use them. Um, but eventually when spring comes along that you get the new growth there, uh, if you cut these down, I'd cut them into sections and jam them right underneath the soffit there. Of course, there's a little loop, you know, a little indentation here. Uh, and I've just jammed them in there and they're uh, taken up very quickly by mason wasps. Which uh, they carry little strips of uh, little bits of grass in there, and they'll make about four chambers that lay an egg in each one, with a little, you know, a little uh, paralyzed spider. You know how they work here, much like a dirt dog does. And then uh, eventually, 
in the winter, uh, you know, uh, woodpeckers will start going after and start pecking into these things. Uh, you have to replace them every so often because they'll just start falling apart. But uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's something you can do for the little wasp there. And unfortunately, wasps feed the feed on caterpillars, so right, not the greatest thing to have in a butterfly garden. But you know, think of the whole the big picture and the whole food chain here. This is wild senna, another good um, food plant here, uh, a legume here. And uh, this this is either a cloudless sulfur or maybe a sleepy orange, not sure which. Some of these some of these uh, uh, chrysalids are hard to tell apart. But these seed pods turn brown actually, and if you can imagine this being brown, this this uh, chrysalis just becomes part of the of the seed pod. That's pretty neat camouflage right there. So uh, so wild senna, senna marilandica. Um, and speaking of sleepy orange, here's some sleepy orange butterflies puddling, and we wonder, well, how do they get their name? Yeah, you know, a lot of butterflies they'll have a go to pull an eye spot uh, on, on their wings, um, and these guys instead of having spots, these guys have lines that resemble closed eyes. So they're sitting there puddling away with their eyes closed, but um, but they could certainly see with their compound eyes. Um, uh, Another swallowtail, another uh, good size swallowtail is our is our tiger swallowtail. Here's the mature larva right here. Uh, he spins a little mat of silk and uh, likes to eat poplar. Uh, poplar is a favorite food plant. Uh, ash is another food plant. I think they I think they feed on cherry also, but um, of course that uh, that's one of the ones easy to identify here. The, the male has very little blue at the bottom of the hind wing, whereas the female has lots of blue. Kind of a powdery blue on the on the hind wing there, so uh, that's another good one to have. This is a uh, this is a long hunter right there, uh, nectaring on the liatris. Um, this we look at this this spice bush sapling here. This is in the yard here. I got a lot of spice bush now, and it grows all over the place. But if you look, there's a couple little folded leaves, and, uh, and then maybe a little bit bigger one, and then an absolute bigger one the entire leaf here. Like the silver spotted skipper, the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar takes a leaf. They'll take a little section of leaf and they'll fold it over. They, they, they pay out a little mat of silk and as it dries, it, it closes up and they, uh, they make a little shelter out of it. And as they grow, they outgrow the shelter. They just make a bigger and bigger one until they fold an entire leaf. And uh, that's the early instar. Uh, looks like a cross between a bird turd and a snake. These big eye spots here. Um, even showing the reflective, what looks like the, the reflection off of a, uh, the eye scale on a snake here. It's actually not a reflection at all. That's actual coloration on there to, to make it look like a uh, look like the, the reflective surface of a, of a snake's eye. So it's a pretty elaborate defense here. And see, that's there's there's the mat of silk here. And then you hold that open with a paper clip here. And that's the mature larva right there again with that, uh, that weird little coloration on the on the eye spot uh, here. <clears throat> and they have those Osmeterian too. You, you bother them enough, they'll stick their horns out there. But uh, um, they emerge into the spice bush swallowtail. Of course, uh, one way to tell if you get to look at these things, particularly in, in your binoculars here, you know, these, uh, these spots, these hind wing spots, the third one up looks like a little meteor. That's one way to, to remember this guy here. Uh, it looks like a little comet or a meteor here. And it's uh, nectaring on the uh, cardinal flower, another great flower for both hummingbirds and butterflies here. But uh, I think you have to have kind of a wet area to really have a, uh, have successful be, have success with cardinal flower. <clears throat> um, here's the uh, our uh, coral honeysuckle uh, with a, a hummingbird feeding on it. Uh, of course, Richard Connors took that picture. I, I did not. Um, we look a little closer. It is actually the food plant of the snowberry clearwing, uh, sphinx moth. Of course, it's a sphinx. It's got a little horn on its on its abdomen here, uh, which cannot sting at all here. But they feed on the leaves there, and they become one of the clearwing moths, which is a great bumblebee mimic. Here's a male. This is probably the female on this side here. Looks a little bigger than, than this one here. Uh, this, is a, this is about the most common of the clearwings. There's about half a dozen species of clearwings in, in, in Tennessee. And here's one that's uh, nectaring uh, on liatris and looking very much like a, a hummingbird. Uh, sometimes they call hummingbird moths. Uh, but more, it's more a real bee mimic than anything. And uh, they're uh, wonderful to have around. So 
And if you look closely, you might find some really weird things. It was the summer before last. I'm walking in my driveway, and again, I have a couple of hackberry trees. So hackberries are a food plant for the snout butterfly, as well as the hackberry emperor and the tawny emperor. So here's a hackberry emperor, and I said, what's so funny about him? If you look at his, he's got the head of a caterpillar. And sure enough, that's a better shot right there. <clears throat> he had he had a, a, a caterpillar head still, still on him. No eyes, no developed mouth parts at all, but he could turn he turned that head around, looked strange like the movie The Fly. And I was like, help me, help me. It looked a strange looking thing. I, I tossed him up into the air. He could not fly. He just kind of fluttered to the ground. He had one, and, and instead of six uh, legs, he's got he had four and a couple like um, not very well developed ones right here. So I got some good pictures of him. And uh, I uh, I sent him to the McGuire uh, Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity at the University of Florida. Uh, it, was, it was recommended by Michael Byerly, actually. And uh, so I, I put him in the freezer. He did, the, the guy there told me, the guy I spoke with, told me exactly how to package him. And he was very excited to see that. He goes, that you know, it, it, that happens in nature, probably not to, it's not terribly uncommon, but it's very uncommon to make something to make it all the way to adulthood. So it was uh, very interesting. He said he'd seen a few of those, in the, and, and he, had, he had a couple in the collection. So, so just things to look out for in, in, in your uh, uh, in your garden there. Uh, also, you know, the, these guys they don't also they don't all eat leaves. Um, this is a silvery checker spot caterpillar that likes to feed on uh, uh, feed on petals. There are other little blues and hair streaks. That like the petals of flowers. Some will eat the bracts of uh, bracts of the dogwood leaves too. And there's a the silvery checker spot right there that's nectaring on the um, a blue mist flower. Another great one. I think you can buy that. It's in the trade now. It's kind of a weedy thing, but I have it grown all over the yard. I just let it grow all over the yard, and the, and the, and the butterflies love it. Too. So um, here's a big patch of liatris up at the Savage Gulf Ranger Station. If you if you make it up there to South Cumberland Recreation Area. Uh, this was a kind of an early Iris Fund project. Instead, this used to be mowed all the time, and uh, uh, seeded it in with uh, liatris and uh, uh, coneflower, um, several other species here. And it was, it's a it's a great milieu for the uh, great spangled fritillary, our, the, about our largest fritillary, I guess, um, that we see bouncing around there. But being where it is in the Southern Cumberland Plateau, if you get up there. Look around for this one. This is a rare one. It's called a Diana fritillary. And this is the male here who likes to get out in the open. If you want to see the female, take a walk in the woods. You don't see the female. The female looks different. She's got a black. She's got that black coloration uh, with, with white. Uh, looks really kind of, kind of a good bit different. Um, uh, it resembles a, resembles a butterf butterfly called a white admiral. But anyway, you don't find her out in the field. You find her in the woods almost exclusively. And you find him exclusively out in out in the open here. So, so anyway, that's uh, something uh, to keep an eye out for. Um, uh, in, in, in midsummer on, I've seen them there. They used to have a very large range. It's been compressed pretty much down to the plateau and into northern Alabama. I've seen them at Cumberland Mountain. I've seen them in Pickett in the Upper Cumberlands, um, and in uh, northern Alabama. I think Joe Wheeler State Park. I've seen them down there. It's the only place I've seen them here. So. Uh, so they like those higher elevation areas, um, pretty much the plateau in Tennessee. So, so anyway, that's uh, plant it and they will come. The, there's these sachems all over the uh, lajes of Montgomery Bell, um, and and I think that's about it. Asters, another good fall plant, fall food plant, or the uh, the the uh, I have a fire skipper. This is fire skipper and a buckeye right here. And I think that closes the show. So. so. Well, thank you, John. Questions? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that made some sense. <laughs> lots. Lots of tips of things to look for, where to look for them, and uh, what things to plant. And there are a bunch of questions, some of which have already been answered in the chat, but we'll run through them. Uh, maybe Bettina, you'll help me a little here. The first question is wafer ash, a kind of ash tree. Um, apparently not. It's a what in the rutaceae, 
or citrus family? Uh, oh, and then well, Margie chimes in with um, uh, Cattleya trifoliata. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, ash yeah it's, or hop tree is not right. It's not. It's not a. It's not an ash tree. It's not a fraxinus. Yeah, it's a Tellia trifoliata. Um, I think it's its own. It's its own family, I believe. I, I don't know if it has any other relatives. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what was the, what was the question about the citrus? Did you say the, the... no that uh, citrus family? It's is it citrus, citrus family? Uh, I I don't think it is. I, I believe it's its own family. I, I believe. Okay. Like the Teleaceae, something like that. I, I may be wrong on that, but I, I haven't looked in a while. But um, but yeah, if you have an orange tree of some kind of citrus in your yard, you know that that um, I would, I would think that they would feed on that also. But again, that garden root, if you can find it, uh, that's another good food plant for for the giants. Uh, Another one was the, uh, the zinnia na is native to Texas, but not Tennessee. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I figured, I thought it was more more to the west here. Uh, uh, and there's, there's another one like that. I want to say, and it was put in that Savage Gulf uh, that I didn't know was put in the mix there. Is it Indian blanket? Is it Indian blanket found in Texas? But I know it's not here. It's not native here, but... Uh, uh, that's another one, another good plant, another good uh, nectar plant, anyway. But, yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, good to know about zinnia. Yes. Another uh, one is uh, do zebra swallowtail larvae fold the leaves on pawpaw trees? Uh, no. They uh, they will go down and the, they they do their sheltering in the in down at the base of the tree. So I've not seen any any evidence of uh of them using utilizing the leaves but you'll Bart, see the chewed leaves you will see that you will see the chewed leaves yeah bart said it, thought that they do when they're smaller oh bart. well uh, well uh, yeah okay but that may be true i've reared them when they're small and actually we were talking about uh, cannibals earlier uh, or uh, uh carnivorous uh um carnivorous caterpillars you have to rear them separately because they will eat each other <laughs> the uh the paw paw i mean the uh yeah zebra swallowtails are known for you know, eating each other i've reared them not in any great numbers at all but i've not noticed them uh, uh making any shelter i'd like to yeah i'd like to know more about that so uh huh, okay and one comment is thank you for the seminar it was really nice i really enjoyed it great. from dakota uh does anyone else have questions if so unmute yourself and ask away here. Anyone? Okay. Oh. Silence. They must yeah. have asked okay. all of us. Oh boy, I guess we covered all the bases. <laughs> and uh, Telia and Garden Rue are both in the Rutaceae. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm corrected then on that. Uh, Rue well, and citrus family of felt felt flowering plants. No, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so that makes sense that they would like it. Um, and it's funny that the black swallowtail likes the rue also, when it's normally has that affinity for the you know the carrot species, you know the <laughs> wild carrot and the uh, the alexanders and and so on. So. Um, I don't know, is there anything else that black swallowtails eat? I don't know if you. With well, a bark could answer that, but uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Feeding on any trees at all, but uh, but um, I haven't I haven't seen them use anything other than carrot family members, really. Right, right. Uh, I think maybe in a garden situation, you might get something weird. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I've I've not seen them uh, anything other than just yeah, Queen Anne's lace and Golden Alexander's. That's about it, and then the garden roof, of course. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, and dill and parsley. <laughs> yeah, parsley. Yeah, exactly. yeah, because of course the fennel and the dill and any of those, uh, um, any of that family. Yeah, they'll take care of your uh, uh, dill plants, right? <laughs> Eat them right down to the down to the nub. So, if anyone's looking for plants. There is a plant, plant sale at 
Cedars of Lebanon on this Saturday coming. Um, they had their annual plant sale. They've separated it from the Elsie Quarterman Festival. So Saturday, this coming Saturday is plant sale at Cedars of Lebanon. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's like 10 to three. So it's, and it's a native, I think it's pretty much native plants, if not all. So yeah, it's pretty it's much a good it's one it's to go exclusively to. native. Yeah, but it always has been. But. Yeah, so. it's, it's a good little sale to go to. So if anybody's looking for specific plants now, that'd be a good place to hit if you're here in Middle Tennessee somewhere. Um, well, thank you very much, John. But that was okay. that was interesting, intriguing, and great pictures. And really thrilled that you joined us. Um, it's, yeah, it's also, been lovely. Yeah, if any other questions or comments come up, you have my email address if you want to you know, pass that along if anybody else. Okay, know, I'll be. Questions I'll came to you. come to mind or anything, but. Okay. I can't answer a bark and probably answer it, I would imagine. So. <laughs> well, a lot of folks have specialty areas where right. they might know just a little bit more than a lot of others. And uh, some know a lot about a lot of things, like Bart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Lots of messages for um, loved it. Thanks. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Great presentation. Thanks. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John. This was great. Lots of lovely comments for you. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. I, I'm really glad to thank you for coming. Have fun and I, doing thank, it. I thank everyone for, for coming to enjoy this nice seminar. It has been recorded. So if you need to go back and refer to something, it will be on our website by the end of the week on the uh, seminars page. Oh, great, great. Okay. And we do have someone asking specifically what the email is or where to find it. Um, well, you want to, want to rattle it off and I'll put it in the chat box. Otherwise I'd have to pull up my email program. So what's your email, John? It's a, a JD is in Daniel. F is in Frank. R O E S C H. So that's a JD F R O E S C H at yahoo.com. Okay, there it is for everybody. So if you need it, copy it down. Thank you again, okay. John. Oh, you're welcome. All right, thanks very much. Very enjoyed it. Right. Much appreciated your coming. Okay. And hope you join us again sometime. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see, you, see you in the counting butterflies somewhere. <laughs> right. Some of us. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good night, everyone. Good night.